my son-in-law was called up on October the 7th and I, my daughter and I dropped him off at the army base, not knowing when and if we'd see him again. And he was ready to just go in and um, help save Am Yisrael along with my oldest uh, uh, soldier son. And, uh, and the baby and my daughter was eight months pregnant when uh, he was sent in. I was, I was worried sick for my daughter, her health, uh, her pregnancy, and thank God she carried through. Baby was born healthy. Uh, he carried on serving. And they, they gave him off for about two and a half weeks or so to have the baby and uh, be home with my daughter to help her out a little bit. And then he was right back to the front lines. And, uh, and he was just released maybe um, two weeks ago. He was home every weekend after the baby was born. So he did get a chance to be with her and the baby. And she stayed with us for another month. And, uh, and then she went back to her home in Cholon. But until then, she did the, he saw the baby at least two or three days every week. She was remarkable. I've, I just have awe for her. Uh, she really carried through. She was fully focused on her son, making sure that he was just well protected and cared for. And, uh, and she has a tremendous amount of faith. And that's what really got her through this. Well, I got up at the 6.30 in the morning when I started hearing those first booms. And everyone in my family has ADHD. So they were all sleeping deeply right through it, didn't hear a thing. And I kind of elbowed my husband, something's going on. And he woke up. We were very confused because it was two hours of constant booming. At about 8.15, that first siren rang. We don't usually get sirens um, in my area. You know, every area has its... Uh, has its challenges and its pluses. So here we, we don't usually get rockets. We get more terrorist attacks. Um, and so this is the life of, of living here in Israel. Choose your poison. And uh, so we heard the siren and it, it shocked all of us. And we came running down to our to our uh, bomb shelter. And, uh, and then we were like, okay, we're all up. It was fun. It was actually the first time all of my kids got up on time to go pray. So it was kind of like, oh, okay, thanks for the wake up. But then it got less funny as, as the next and the next and the next. And my, my husband and kids tried to head out to, to pray themselves. And they, you know, and, and the rockets kept falling. We don't have an iron dome over our area. So we really actually have to get to, to safety very quickly. Um, and, and it's only because we don't usually have that exposure. So it's usually just not very scary. Um, but we were all sent home and we, and we did the, we, we tried to do Simchat Torah in, in our house and we invited the neighbors and we got a Torah and we're dancing, we're singing, and I'm kind of have an eye on my son in the corner of our yard. And he's a big, strong guy. He's a brave soldier. He just finished his, his army service. So he's not supposed to be called up again for a full year. And, uh, and I'm looking at him, he has his phone on because of the rockets uh, so they, the, all the soldiers immediately turned their phones on to get a sense of what was going on and to see if they were going to be called up. And I'm watching this brave, amazing boy just kind of shrinking into himself. And I walked over and I said, what's going on? And he says, things are really bad. And, you know, BB's just declared war. And there's tens of people have been killed. And he's in the Nachal and his army base all the guys that he knows, every single one of those, over 20 guys, he knew each one of them personally, and they were killed on that very first day. And and, and the Nachal is sharing this information with him, and he says, Zima, it's no good. It's no good. We're in trouble. And I see the, the boys putting on their uniforms and and heading out to the street and the parents blessing their sons and other and other people jumping into cars to bring them to wherever they needed to go. And, and what was remarkable, uh, besides for just seeing how people were so willing to just charge out to help, to protect, was that we all worked together and the blessings came from everybody. And, and that was very touching and very heartwarming. My, my daughter and son-in-law were in Cholon, which is, was being pummeled, obviously. That's, that's in the center of the country near Tel Aviv. Uh, so I started getting very worried about her, knowing about you know, her being pregnant and not knowing if they were safe. Um, and right after Shabbat, thank God, she called and asked me to come pick her up. And uh, and no mother is going to say no to that request. I put on my gun because that's the thing to do when there are rockets falling. You must have your, your little pistol strapped to your waist. 
And I charged out there and, and I'm thinking, okay, so what do I do if, if a rocket falls right here? I don't know. I, I, I pulled to this. I have no idea what to do, but I've got to get, I got to get my girl. I've got to get her husband. I, and I don't even know where to take them. Where, where is safe? Um, so that was the confusion of that first horrifying day. He was called up right away and they hadn't, they didn't have their phones on. They, they were in, in shul the entire day. Uh, so they did not, they, they didn't really know what was going on, believe it or not. And, uh, um, so he was the second he turned his phone on, it was ringing. And uh, so I was able to drop him at the army base. That was, I, I think about that and it, it brings me to tears every time anew seeing my, my daughter, uh, parting with her husband. And I just kind of walked away to give them their privacy because it, it wasn't my, it, it wasn't my story. It was hers and his and um, just bringing her back to my house and trying to reassure her, but not knowing if my words were empty or not, not knowing anything, but just, just hugging her and holding her. And, you know, it, it really, it stirs me up every time, even though I know he's okay now, just thinking about that scene and, and also there, we were not the only car. There were hundreds and hundreds of cars that the cars, basically people just stopped their car, ran out and charged toward, toward the base. And my son actually had a, a cast on his, on his arm. He was, he had just broken his arm recently, a little bit before that. And I said to him, listen, you can't go. You're injured. You have to sit this one out. I didn't realize how big this one was going to be. But he looked at me in the eye and he said, Ima, I'm going. And there was nothing else I could say. And he did. We dropped him off that night. Nobody slept. Uh, you know, as the news rolled in, the whole household was up. The whole neighborhood was up. There were lights on in every single house. Soldiers were leaving throughout the night and our son was called to, to be at his base at three in the morning. So we drove him into Jerusalem and uh, even in Jerusalem, there was this surreal feeling going on. And uh, we parted ways with him at three in the morning and obviously did not sleep, you know, cried quietly. So no one would see just how shaken up I was. And um, yeah, and the rest, the rest uh, kind of rolls on as we all know. By the time he and his unit and the entire um, company was marched into Gaza, and they, they, I asked him afterwards, so how'd you get into Gaza? He says, I walked. I'm like, no, no, really, what vehicle carried my legs? Okay, so they, by the time they actually marched into Gaza, um, his arm was fully healed. Yeah, this was the very next morning. Uh, you know, without any sleep, we were all delirious and bleary eyed and trying to make sense of what was going on. And uh, we realized that all of these soldiers had been called up and the army was absolutely not prepared to feed them or to clothe them or to give them even bulletproof vests or helmets. Like it, it was, it was total chaos for everybody. We invited over neighbors and friends and we started getting small donations to be able to go out and buy meat and bread and whatever we needed. And we had people come over and we created a kind of Tehillim prayer preparing food event. And we prepared food for hundreds of soldiers because we started out, our plan was to feed the base in Hebron, which was over 100 soldiers. But then it turned out that there were all these outposts uh, further out in the area called Drom Har Hebron. Though my daughters and I uh, packed the car with not only the food we had prepared in our house, but also I put the word out, we're bringing food to soldiers and the women donated. My God, I have a big car and we filled it to the top. There was no room, barely room for humans. And we went out there, we fed the Hebron base, we kept going and we as far into the territories as we possibly could, 15 soldiers here and 10 soldiers there. And we just kept feeding them. Um, and until finally the food did kick in, kick in about uh, you know five six days into the war, the army caught up with itself and started giving them proper food. This is my daughter was in her eighth month and she was just as involved with preparing the food and praying and and everything else that we were doing. My son called from the border of Gaza and they were getting ready to to march in, and he said, "Listen, Ima, could you please get me a bulletproof vest?" And I'm like. Sure, son, anything. 
<laughs> and, and I'm like, okay, where does one get a bulletproof vest? So I go online and I'm trying to figure out, call all of the different uh, manufacturers in Israel for bulletproof vests. There are none to be had. We had nothing, nothing, no backup. So I could not find my son a bulletproof vest, but it wasn't just him. It was his entire unit. And my son-in-law's mother was doing the exact same thing, trying to figure out how to get bulletproof vests for my son-in-law and his unit. And I got in touch with a rabbi in South Africa through my sister. And we and he and he said, Okay, we're going to get you the vests. We're donating, you know, and, and they they shipped over first one for my son. And I said, Well, I can't give my son a vest without his entire unit getting a vest. That that's not right. So we got another shipment and another shipment. And then he's like, Okay, do you need more vests? I said, We need thousands of vests because suddenly, oh my God, this woman could get vests. So people start calling me. Where do we get the vests from? How do we get the vests? How much do they cost? So I start raising money. He says, how many vests do you need? How many can you pay for? I say, send me a hundred. He says, do you understand how much each one of them costs? I said, by the end of the day, we'll have money for a hundred vests. Put them on the shipment. By the end of the day, this is an amazing nation. We had enough money for 100 best vests, each vest costing $500. Uh, so imagine how much we raised in that one day. And then the orders kept flowing in. So we started sending these vests by customs, which is a terrible idea. Oh, my God. Dealing with customs was an absolute nightmare. But we landed up with uh, an extended team. Uh, wonderful Jews from all over the world. And I actually got huge donations from uh, a, a Christian group in Oklahoma. And uh, we, we managed to keep getting the money we needed and uh, bringing in as many vests as we can. And then we started also getting helmets for soldiers. And I, I really did get connected with a lot, of, a lot of other amazing people. And now the soldiers will turn directly to us and our group and tell us what they need. And I'm continuing to raise money. We need to be protecting them as they protect us. So we've been helping our soldiers replace their helmets or get newer helmets that they could actually put a flashlight on. Uh, we, I was already a member of Chaver Kaddish. I had joined in memory of my dear friend, uh, Stella Frankel, who had passed away. And I, I wanted to do something in her memory. And she was a prominent member of her Chaver Kaddish back in, in America and in Potomac, actually. So I, uh, so I joined and um, then we got a call that all of the bodies uh, the, of civilians who had been massacred were being brought to um, the burial uh, center in uh, Rishon Lezion, also right near Tel Aviv. And uh, they were overwhelmed. They could not possibly uh, help to bury all of these bodies. Could the Gush Etzion Hever Kadisha join them? And first they called the men in. And my husband was called and, and a couple of neighbors and they, they agreed, obviously, right away to go. And within 24 hours, they said, okay, we're going to need the women as well. And so my husband had turned to me and said, can you get together a group of women to join? And I, I called the other women from the Chavar Kadisha that I knew of in Gush Etzion, And not one of them said no, which was remarkable. And so that the exactly a week after the war broke out, we were asked to head out to Rishon Nation on Saturday night for the night shift from nine o'clock at night until whatever time in in the middle of two, three, four in the morning, uh, the work had to be done, depending on how many bodies were there. We had no idea what we were about to encounter. We had a neighbor who had been there before, like he had gone Thursday night. So he kind of prepared us a little bit. He said it would be absolutely horrific. We would never be able to forget the sights, the smells. Um, but we have to just, you know, strengthen ourselves and power through and just do it because the nation needed us then. And I'm thinking to myself, my son, my son-in-law, everybody's sons are just marched out the door. How can I not? And as a mother thinking I'm sending my child to protect our home instead of being me that protects the home. What an awful feeling. It, it was, it doesn't sit right with me to today. He should be home safe while his parents go to the border and protect. And obviously he's better equipped and better armed and, and way more capable than us. And that's why we send our boys. But it's, it's just a terrible, terrible, heavy feeling to know that they have to protect us. 
So I said, my son's on the front lines. We're going. And we did. And I expected something awful, horrible that I would never forget. And just the, the awfulness of it. And, and that's not what I encountered. I encountered something completely different. I encountered a feeling of, of love, of responsibility, of, of compassion, of togetherness of the entire nation when we got there. Obviously, it was incredibly hard. And, and I will not forget the sights I saw. But I also will not forget the the love I felt for every single woman, grandmother, aunt, little girl that I assisted in in burying. The work is very, very physical. You're you're pulling the body close to you um, in order to be able to wrap it properly, in order to be able to make sure that you don't lose even a drop of blood. And uh, and you'd think that that would be horrifying, especially since we have to remember these bodies had been killed a week before. So they were not, even besides the fact that that every single one of them was mutilated in some way, uh, most of them in terrible, horrific ways, they also, their bodies had already started to decompose. And you would think that this would be something you just can't even be in the same room as. And yet we were holding these bodies up against our chest, up against our stomach. And it wasn't horrifying. It was a hug. And and I felt the hug, and I and I felt that I felt connected with this woman who all I knew about her was her name, and I could guess at her age, but that's it. We started on a Saturday night, and we worked through until Thursday. I was there just about every day. They, they actually told us not to come every day, just to preserve our sanity, um, and uh, so I was there just about every day, and the work was was. That first night was the most challenging because they had spent all of Shabbat identifying bodies. Every single body had to go through a DNA test. And that tells us what the Hamas enemy had done to our people. So over that Shabbat, they had identified a tremendous amount of the bodies. They also couldn't remove the bodies from the site of the rave as well as from the communities because Hamas had actually planted uh, all sorts of bombs and explosive materials on and around the bodies. So just extracting them from there took a long time and was very carefully done. The Alon unit was very much involved with that. And uh, and so it took a while to even get them. So that Saturday night, we, we worked nonstop, body after body after body. Um, and then the rest of the week, it was a little bit slower. And we got to Thursday, they had only identified um, 85% of the, the bodies, but could not find any remnants of any of the rest of the 15% of bodies at all. They have something and, and some kind of space, I think that they would consider like a, a grave, but, but they, don't, they don't have a body. And, and even with the hard work that we had to do and the emotional toll that it was taking on us, nothing was more emotionally stressful for us than knowing that we couldn't finish our job. I had the, um, I guess, two things that were very protective for me was knowing that I was doing God's work. And uh, that really gave me a lot of a lot of strength. And also knowing that we were doing it together. Going into that building in Rishon Lezion, we had the guard at the entrance and then we had the police uh, men and women, and we had secular, religious, uh, Swarni Ashkenazi men, women, no children, thankfully. Uh, and we were all together and meeting up with each other every day was very powerful. And seeing people that were most, most of the people there were volunteers and they were the ambulance drivers and the, and the Zaka drivers, uh, the people bringing bodies in and then taking them directly to their burial and knowing that the whole family was waiting. And the minute that this woman, this, this precious sister of ours was, was ready for burial, that there was a, a group of Jews waiting for her, waiting to bury her broken hearted, but knowing that we were doing our best to prepare her as quickly as possible so that at least the family would have closure that, that gave us a lot of strength, that unity and that, and, and that, the godliness of of the work itself. Um, besides for that, I I really tried very hard not to burden my children, even the older ones. I ha I have older children, 
And I did not want to discuss the work at all with them. And just recently, just last week, I gave a talk to a, a group of, uh, of people that are coming in to really visit, help, be part of what's going on here for Amishel. And um, my children surprised me and they showed up. And uh, it was the first time that I had really discussed this in front of them. And uh, it wasn't great. It wasn't, I, I felt like I had to kind of hold back a little bit because my, my little girl, I didn't want her to be hearing too much information. My soldier does not need to, he saw enough. He was one that went into the army base afterwards to help clear it out. And he was inside Gaza. He, he's seen plenty. He's also lost so many friends. He's lost his very best friend. And uh, on the 7th, he was in Duvdevan unit. Uh, so he's been through enough. And at some point in the middle, he actually, for his own protection, got up and walked out. And uh, and, my, and my older daughter also, I'm, I'm looking in her eyes and I'm saying, why do I need to cause them this pain? It's not that I need to shelter them. They're strong people, but they don't need to hear every single detail so that we didn't share. But my husband and I would come home together, exhausted at night, and uh, we would share with each other what we had seen. Uh, the first two bodies that my husband cared for were beheaded. And those heads are not going to be buried. They're gone. And these are our brothers and their heads, that's it. They're trophies somewhere. And he needed to share that with someone. And I was there. And then I talked to him about the terrible, terrible sights that I saw. So we had each other, which was very helpful. And listen, we also have a Jewish sense of humor. Really, the, the Chaver Kadisha one day, they ordered tons and tons of pizza and no one was eating the pizza. There were a few people with very, very strong stomachs and good for them. But the rest of us were not eating pizza. And uh, they were like, here, take it home. And then I took back three, four pies of pizza for the kids. I'm like, here, guys, have a Kadisha pizza. Enjoy. It's so, like we, we were able to do a little bit of that as well. Yeah. And I did much more. There was not much crying then. I think uh, that actually that next Friday night, uh, the women got together for a Kabbalah Shabbat. We, we really felt like we needed each other. And it was such a blessing that we did that. And it was also a blessing that I just went on my own. And um, I sat down there ready to dive in. And then it just waterfall and it all came out. And these wonderful women in my community, they didn't know what I was, what I was up to. I wasn't talking about it so much. It didn't need to be talked about. But they just, they let me have, like, didn't come over. Well, what's going on? Are you okay? They, they gave me space and I just cried and cried. And uh, since then, I think I've cried in shul probably every single Shabbat from something, just praying for the soldiers. Whoop, there it goes. Um, you know, Parshat Zachar, wow, that finished me off. That, <laughs> who would have thought? But uh, it was like suddenly like, this is now, this is now. <sighs> My other son uh, learned in Mechina for two years. He went in like a man. And this one, he's like, he's 18 years old. I'm like, you know, I'm not, I'm not wiping his nose anymore. He's actually quite an independent guy. He's amazing. And uh, it's just that he's, he's very young. And he did not get a chance to really learn because the army was like, we need boys now. And they cut his Mechina um, year and they, and they pulled him in. And uh, that, that's been very, very challenging for me because, uh, you know, sending your son off to start his, his army service in the middle of a war is a whole different picture. When I sent over my, my older son, there was pride. There was like, you go, boy, do great. We're so, you know, this is amazing. It's going to grow you up. And here it's like, oh, my God, you're 18 and oh, yeah, is it going to grow you up but into a war? Like, what? That's insane. We just have to keep praying. Keep praying. I think that the lowest point for us was uh, finding out that my son's dear friend, Yosef, Yosef Gedalia, um, when, when he was killed. And uh, that was just we found out two days after the war broke out because Thank God they found his body and it was not kidnapped into Gaza. And he was actually protected because of his seat that he was wearing. So he was already dead. And, and the soldiers didn't know if he was terrorist or an Israeli soldiers because terrorists did have 
Israeli soldier uniforms as well. So they, they, they saw him and they didn't know if they should be defending his body. And then they saw the tzitzit and they did defend his body and made sure that it, that it stayed with us and he got a proper burial right away. Uh, but hearing that tragedy, knowing this boy, he was newly married to a beautiful, beautiful young woman. Uh, she's, she's unbelievable. She's, she's out there speaking to groups and inspiring the world while she's dealing with this, this tragedy. But I think that um, we did not have a way to speak to our son, to let him know. And I wouldn't have had known how to let him know. He found out through the WhatsApp groups that, that he's on, because this is a friend of his from Mechinat Eli. So the, the Eli uh, Yeshiva announced it. And he saw that, and uh, we hadn't seen him for a couple of days. We didn't know where he was, what he was doing. And he just appeared in the front, at our front door. And I said, Gavriel, what are you doing home? And he looks at me and he says, I came home for a funeral. And we both really collapsed at that point. And uh, the agony of that is is going to stay with me forever. And uh, knowing that my son goes to Har Herzl to, to be at his friend's grave often, to pray there, to connect with him, to talk to him, is uh, it breaks my heart. And he's lost over well over 30 friends in this war. And, um, I just pray for the well being of our boys, all of them. They're all in severe trauma. They've all suffered losses that, that we should never have to suffer in their young lives. And, and that weighs very, very heavily on me. And, and I just hope that Hashem can protect our boys who are, thank God, alive and physically well and, and help them get through the, this, uh, this terrible time. We raise them to honor life family, country. And, and they're doing that. They, we've, we've done well. Our messaging has been good. It's been consistent. And we've raised a remarkable generation of people. And I'm saying boys, but I mean the girls in there too, by the way, just as in my family, it's, it's uh, male soldiers. But uh, there are many female combat soldiers who are, are doing their part and, and going through a tremendous amount and uh, there are amazing organizations that are also supporting specifically the female combat soldiers. And, and they all need a hug from us. And that hug looks different for every single person. But don't sit on the sidelines. Do something for our brothers and sisters in arms. Being here on the ground and helping bury the dead, that's one way. If it means writing a check or giving a donation, that's another way. They're equally important. I had a WhatsApp group of about 200 uh, parents, a silent group, where once a day we would hear, the guys are doing great. And we're like, all righty then. <laughs> and that's it. Yeah. And then at some point we were told that we could – um, you know, send some food in or gather money for them. And we did, we, we actually sent them New Delhi and uh, they got it on a Friday night, which was really nice. And uh, my son actually came and when he came back, he said that that was like a real highlight for them getting these New Delhi sandwiches. So, so they felt our love, but there was no communication. Before Purim, we had, we sent uh, a thousand Moshlechema note into Khan Yunus. Uh, with letters from everyone all over the country. It was beautiful. And we had from Herzliya to Gush Etzion to Yerushalayim, the secular, religious, didn't matter. People were packaging, writing letters, sending. It was an unbelievable initiative and, and really gave me a tremendous amount of strength. And then we got notice, actually, some of my friends' sons, including my nephew, received uh, our little packages for them. And it really warmed their hearts and ours. So that was beautiful. We're a resilient nation. We've been through a lot. And God willing, we're heading toward better times. We have to keep the faith. Am Yisrael Chai, we're, we're alive, we're vibrant, and our strength is in our hope. Our strength is in our unity. So we have to not get into the pettiness of the fight. We have to step back and be better than it and know that we're, we're a family.